I want to ask this question. What do meteors, meteors out in the sky, what does that have to do with today's message? We're going to find out. Does he know? No, he's super excited, though. Okay, all right. So we got one person on the hook. Dylan, so this is now. for you. All right, two main questions that we're going to ask today is, what does it mean to follow the Lord versus ourselves? The second one is, how do I stand up for the Lord in the midst of a generation that doesn't want to hear about him? So point one that we're going to get into uh, is afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia, Achaia yeah. before going to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. And that's from uh, so Acts that's, 19.21. Yeah, Acts 19.21. Can we uh, put that up on the screen? Do we, yep. I got my lovely bride back there helping out today. So th this is what Nate was talking about is from Acts 19.21. And remember, we left off at Acts 19, chapter 20, when uh, Paul was there in Ephesus when he was ministering to the people. We, we saw so much stuff happening that it says that if, if you think about that, if there's something really good happening, the Lord is moving mightily, and you're like, nope, time for me to go. You're like, well, but there's so much good stuff happening, but that's Paul's, that's where his mind yeah. was, is he felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. Again, his calling, what the Lord has called him to do is to be an apostle, to, to not to be the pastor of one church, but to go and make uh, many different churches. And real quick before we talk about this, and, and Nate's going to talk about the, the different translations, but it says here in the, can we throw that back up? This is the New Living Translation. And it says, afterward, Paul felt compelled by the capital S Spirit. That refers to the Holy Spirit. But the other translations don't really back that up. No, they don't. Necessarily. Uh, other translations say resolved by the Spirit, purposed in the Spirit, determined and compelled by the Spirit. Um, so it, in other words, Paul made up his own mind. So right. it wasn't a, necessarily a leading of the Holy Spirit. Some say, yes, it was. Others say, no, it wasn't. Paul just kind of made up and his so mind. And so it led us to ask the question, was it him or was it the Lord that was leading him to that? And then, uh, you know, Paul said, I must go as if it were a moral obligation to preach in Rome. And I and think a lot of us have been there. Yeah. And we see that at the very end. It says, I mm -hmm. must go on to Rome. It's not, I would like to go yeah. to Rome. It's, I must go. And I know each of us in our lives have made, had those things where you just, I don't like saying feelings, but you have that gut push and I have what I call you have that you can tell when it's the Holy Spirit pushing you because it's something that you usually sometimes don't want to do mm -hmm. but you're kind of being pushed to do it anyways and then you have those things like you just it's the right thing to do and so you're asking the Lord like do I need to do this or not you know and so I think it's what we see here from Paul is that obligation of this is something that I gotta do yeah yeah, and, and like what Nate said, and I, and I like how that was phrased, that moral obligation of I must go to Rome. And, and so I love when we can look at Scripture and allow Scripture to define other Scripture. So um, we're going to go ahead and put up Romans chapter 1. This is verses 10 through 15. And again, this is Paul's explanation of why I must go to Rome. Why should I leave this awesome ministry in Ephesus and go on to Rome. Again, it's, it's, there's a, a bigger picture, and I think that the Lord revealed it to Paul. So do you want to yeah. take us through Romans so 1? Romans, uh, Romans 1, 10 through 15. So we're starting in verse 10. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. I'm going to stop it real quick right there. It's almost like that should be what our prayers always are and start with is yep. this opportunity if it's your will, God's willing. Verse 11, for I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but also want to be encouraged by yours. Man, that's, that's you know, we should be praying that every, you know, every time we gather together. Yeah, and, and, and we see Paul's humility yeah. is he's not the end-all, be-all. He's saying, I'm, I'm praying 
um, for you guys to be encouraged, but I also want to be encouraged by you, that it's a, a two-way street yeah. for... Uh, verse 13, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome, too, to preach the good news. Well, that verse 14 really backs that up. For I have a great sense of obligation to people both in the civilized and uncivilized world, the rest of the world, educated and uneducated alike. I, I have that need and that desire, that sense of obligation to yeah. come into verse 15, to preach the good news, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with this Gentile world. And that's really what his commission was from Christ himself, was to go out and to preach the good news to a world that has never heard it, that would not really be receptive to it. But the question is, so here in the text, when we look back in Acts 19, Paul's saying, I must go on to Rome. I'm, I must do this. I've, I've purposed, I've determined, I've made up my mind. Was he following the leading of the Spirit or was he following his own self? Let me kind of ask that question a little bit differently to put it into kind of our context. Let's say I have my own situation. Let's say it's a new job opportunity. Maybe it's a place uh, you have an opportunity to move to a different state or something like that. You have a new opportunity out there. Let's ask ourselves this question. How do I know if I'm following the leading of the Lord or if I'm following my own desires? Like I desire this new job that, that pays a lot more money. I want that for my family to be able to provide but is it really the will of the Lord? So that's the question that, that we're looking at today because maybe it's just me, but I have asked that question a lot. And there's a, been a few times where I think I'm following the, the leading of the Lord. <laughs> Looking back, it's like, mm, 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 mm. I tricked myself into thinking right. I was, but really, you know, we over made, here. We is, made sure yeah. that, that his will was what we wanted. Right. We can justify in our minds and move down that path sometimes, yeah. you know. And like you said, then you wake up and go, ooh, that really, really. Yeah, kind of a, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Yeah, looking uh, back. But you, you have a, a story about your, yeah. your brother. Yeah, so um, recently, um, I say in the last seven months or so, um, uh, and this is a story about my brother. He um, was, uh, he had coached in high school and college, been back and forth, and uh, he had, um, had, had the opportunity to go back to college and he was kind of at a point like, okay, like this is what I want to do. I want to get back in at the five-year plan and go with it. And uh, sure enough, Boat gets a phone call. I mean, prayed about it. I know he talked to my dad about it. He talked to me a little bit about it, you know, and it was like this opportunity came up, like let's, let's jump with it and go, you know, and he sought the Lord in that decision, but things kind of happened quick. You know, and because of college rules, things have changed in that landscape. And so, where in the past, you know, you're on the road recruiting. Well, now he was on the road. The window is bigger, and it's a lot. You go on the road recruiting in a bigger window. It used to be just you know, increments during the year. And I think he looked. I say I think I believe this. He looked up and went, mm. I mean, after taking this job and things, and looked up and went, this isn't really what I want anymore. And he, he came to the thing, the conclusion that I want to be home with my wife and my kid. And so the opportunity came back up for him to return to, his, to the high school that he had just left. And so he took it. And the reason I, I, you know, I think that God opened that door for him to go to show him this isn't what you want anymore, mm -hmm. where he had wanted it for a long time. So a lot of times God just blocks it. And that's what I, you know, a lot of us pray for, like just, hey, if it's not supposed to be, just block it and must be done with it. But that happens, and what do we do? We, we still play the what if. You know, and I believe that because because you know what? He, God knows us. He knows how we learn, how we need to see things. And he opened that door. He got there and then he showed him, yeah, this isn't what you want anymore. And so I believe that's what happened. So he was able to go back. Thank the good Lord that it happened all in a you know pretty 
close window of time. But um, it was just a, for me, it was neat to see just that how God works, even like that. He didn't just block it. Yeah. He opened it, let it happen, and went, okay, this isn't it anymore. And then reopened the door for the, same, the opportunity he had to go back yeah. and be at home and those things. So that was just neat to see how God works that way too. Well, in our, our prayers, maybe you guys are, are similar to this, that like what you were talking about, Lord, if it's you, open that door. If it's not, close it. <laughs> Simple. The, the, there's no black and, you know, there's no gray area. It's black and white. Yeah. If this is you, I want this. If this is not you, I want this kind of thing. But when we ask that question, how do I know if I'm following the Lord or following my own desires? I want this. Our, our selfish nature rears, rears its ugly head every so often. So I want to go through just a couple of, of talking points. I, I can't answer that question for you because it, it needs to be done in a prayerful way. But when we're asking, how do I know if I'm following the Lord or I'm following my own desires? Again, we can't compare ourselves to Paul. Paul had a very unique mission, very unique calling. So we can't say, oh, here's what Paul did, so I'm going to do that as well. But we can, it gets us thinking, and, and really, this, our, our hope is that this will prompt you into your own prayer, to a deeper sense of prayer for the Lord. But here's a couple of things to, to keep in mind. Again, with that question, how do I know if I'm following the Lord or following my own desires? The one thing about us is we are sinful people, we are fallen people, we are redeemed, but we are also impatient people, right? Boy, if the Keurig takes longer than normal, oh man, that will ruin your day. Uh, but we are very impatient people. So what we do is, especially when we are bombarded with, you know, all the, the stuff, information, all of that, every day that we pray and then Lord reveal it to me and then we're on our way. We, we want that. Okay, Lord, three to what I didn't hear anything okay I'm gonna go on with my day I've got phone calls to return emails so you're talking about this and right over your head fruits of spirit says patience ah and I'm like of all those I'm like, <laughs> that's that's the one that I want the most yeah you know because I feel like if that happens then these others can mm -hmm. happen but you know yeah, patience is I yeah, I feel that's, that's a good one. point. I'm surprised my bald head didn't blind you from well, seeing I'll, that. Well, I didn't take it there. A little, little, little bit of a reflection you there. The short joke, so I didn't say anything. So. But we, we are impatient people. We, we want it, and we want it right now. We want instant answers. We don't take time to listen. So what's the solution to that? When we pray, listen. Get quiet. Take that phone that's in your pocket or sitting beside you. Put it in the other room. Turn it on silent and... I know that's much easier said than done, but um, a couple other quick things relating to this is we should be listening, but here's the thing. The answer to our question, Lord, is this of you? It may take time. It may not be right away. It may be days, weeks, months, years. Who has that kind of patience to be able to wait on something like that? But the other thing is the answer may be no. If you guys are as thick-skulled and hard-headed as I am, we, sometimes no is not good. Like, I don't want to hear no. This is, yeah. this is what I want. But the Lord may be saying no. The answer no is Man, okay. I'm, I'm even going to add that sometimes it's yes to get us back what the, his real will is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a yes because it really is a no. Yeah. I've seen that happen before. And the other thing is he may want something entirely else for us. So um, I've kind of shared this with, with you yeah. last night, but there was a situation where Whitney and I, we had two decisions, two, op two options. We wanted this one over here because it made sense up here. We wanted this option but really, this is where the Lord wanted us. So we knew it was a possibility, but we, we were praying for this over here. But really, here is where he wanted us. And so we kept trying and trying and trying this over here, and it just wasn't happening. It's like, okay, 
go back, humble yourself, you know, all of that. When this over here was truly revealed, it's like there is not a doubt in my mind. But my question is, what happens if I see God a certain way where I pray and I want this over here? Because this makes sense. I'm going to use scripture in my peanut brain to justify this over here. He wants me over here, but I'm praying for this over here. So I'm praying for us to go this way, but really it's over here. Will God let me scrape my knees, get banged up over here, and then say, okay, dummy, I want you over here. And then eventually that will happen. I believe that, yes. that he, he will. And not, not the same thing with your brother, but along the same lines of there's a pit stop, I guess, yeah. before we get to where it is that, that the Lord wants us. But again, you pointed this out is in uh, Acts 19, 21, Paul said, um, oh, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter one, I always pray for this opportunity, God willing. So the, the biggest thing is for, for us is we need to minimize ourselves and maximize him. What does that look like? God wants us to trust him throughout the entire journey. See, we're destination people. We're GPS, you know, people. We're the GPS generation. You input the destination into the GPS and it takes you there. You don't look at the, the road sign. You're, you're focused. Okay, we're going to get there in three hours and 22 minutes. Oh, if I drive faster, I'll get there in three hours and 19 minutes. Maybe that's just my well, father Well, for those of us that try to beat the time, it, always, it changes now. So yeah, hard. it, always yeah, it automatically speed. updates and you're like, but before you, yeah. before you move on to the next point, I want to, I want to go back to something you said that, cause you told me this last night, you were wanting this, but God was wanting, showing you this. When did you, when was it revealed when you were by yourself without anything in your way and you started praying? Mm -hmm. That's what I loved about that. And you mentioned that earlier about putting the phone away. You said you went and got in a deer stand not to shoot anything, but mm -hmm. to get in the stand, spend time with God, no phone, no anything out there, which I think for a lot of us that's hard to do these days. I mean, yeah. you know, we say it's because of safety, but it's hard not to pull that thing out and scroll a bit and look. But you yeah. got alone with the Lord, mm -hmm. and then he revealed. Yeah, and, and, and what's interesting about it is, again, I'm, I use my hands. Uh, over here, what the Lord revealed to me was not, this is where you need to be. It was, I would consider it a step in the process to get my mind ready that this could be a possibility. And so it, it wasn't clear as day, here, here's what I want you to do. You know, this is, here's your marching order. No, it wasn't that. But so, yeah. So all this to say, he wants us to trust him in the journey, not in just the destination. Yep. And I know the last three years of my life, oh, <laughs> I had one destination in mind, two. I had two destinations in mind, mm -hmm. you know. They were kind of sorted together. And for the first time in 30 years to be there, to go through the journey because I was like, <laughs> I'm done, yeah. you know, and to just get there and to look back and go now and I'm not I'm still not where I want to be but to look back and go okay like I hate the saying time you know heal and I don't say time heals but it does take time mm -hmm. things take time and he gave me glimpses and pieces of things that I did want that were my heart's desires but then showed me that's not really what he has for me mm -hmm. you know but to trust when things were really bad but he would give me a piece of him. He would mm -hmm. give me a piece of his heart. He would show me a little bit of his desires for me. And to show, and to, and, and I think too, trusting him in the journey isn't always just, God, I got you, I trust you. I'm, it's, I think a lot of us know it's not that way. Easier trust said doesn't always done. look yeah. like trust. Yeah. It's a process and it's a battle. But to wake up daily and go, okay, like, all right, I don't know what you have, you know, and, and I'm gonna give it to you today. And like me and Dylan, that we all talk about this, you know, you ask somebody, how do I hand it to God? Nobody can answer that question for you. Yeah. So it's, well, just do it. Well, no, no kidding. Yeah. You know, and so I still can't tell you how to do it. I can't tell. 
somehow I've done it a few times, mm -hmm. you know, and it's helped. But trusting him in the journey and not just the destination. And I've learned, as a lot of us have, that he's getting you ready for something else. You know, and, and I said this last night, you know, the things that I wanted and the things that happened, even the bad things and the, word, the, the good that has come out of it and the, where I am in my relationship with him and growing closer with, with the men in this church and, and God using, you know, things to help people. And I looked up last night when we talked, and I was like, maybe all this didn't happen because, because of me. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's about my kids. Um, I didn't come from a broken home. And I came from a home that we well, didn't have it all together, but there was no doubt in my mind that my parents loved each other and we're going to be together. Mm -hmm. You know, and now my kids, you know, we're, we're 10 and almost 8. Holy moly. <laughs> Golly. Sorry, that's, you're, that's, you're an old man. Mate. I cried like a baby first day of school for my fifth grader. I didn't think I would. I was like, hey, let's roll. We got in there. She took off, and I just lost it. And I was like, this is the last year of elementary school, you know. No, I mean, I just, I had to get out of there in a hurry, <laughs> you know. And uh, But do I believe that God's going to use me to help somebody? Yes. But maybe it's about my girls. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's about my girls coming from a broken home and God using them to reach the world. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what it is, but that's what we're going to, that's, I'm going to ask God that my will lines up with his, but that's what we're going to start preparing for. You yeah. know? And so, but trusting him in the journey. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what it's about with my kids is showing them how to trust yep. him during that journey. Because if, if we kind of, kind of bringing this back is, how do I know if I'm following the Lord or my own desires? If I am not trusting him, if he just gives me what it is that I want, why Where's even trust him? Right. Yeah, what, what's the point in that? He just becomes a, a cosmic genie that will give me whatever I want and life is good. So uh, what we're gonna do right now, and we're not gonna spend too much time on this, is we're going, we need to talk about Artemis and Diana in order to get to the next point that we want to talk about uh, tonight. And it's, it's important for us as we go through Acts that this is what Paul was up against. So the first question was, how do I know if I'm following the Lord or if I'm following my own desires? The second point we're going to ask is, how can I stand up for truth, stand up for what is right, stand up for what is God in the midst of a culture that absolutely hates it. So in order to get to that second point, we need to kind of understand what Paul was up against. Like I said, we're not going to uh, spend a whole lot of time on this. We're not going to dwell on it, I should say. Can we put up uh, the one? Okay, so this right here, beautiful, beautiful building. This is what's known, and it, I encourage you, by the way, I love giving homework. I know you do too. You're a teacher and a coach. No, but I never give uh, homework. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love giving homework. You don't. Uh, but I encourage you to read Acts chapter 19. And we, we picked up in verse 21. For the sake of time, we're not going to cover the, the text verse by verse, which we normally do. But just for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize what is going on here. So this right here is the temple of Diana. But that's her Roman name. Her Greek name is Artemis. So depending on your translation of the Bible, that is who uh, Diana is. Um, so we're going to talk about her in just a second. But a little bit about this building right here. This was built in the 6th century BC. Um, it was 425 feet long, 220 feet wide, 60 feet high, had 127 marble columns that looks kind of like, was that the Supreme Court or know, something like that? has columns like that. This was the largest building in the Greek world at the time. This was also one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If you guys have ever heard about that, this was one of them. This is what was in Ephesus. It also served as a bank in addition to being a temple. So can we show the next picture? That's what it looked like then. then here's what it looks like today. There's one column that's left standing. That is in Ephesus, which is in kind of modern-day Turkey. 
that's all that's left of um, this magnificent um, temple that they had built to Artemis or Diana. So you want to tell us who she is? Yeah, so who is Artemis Diana? She was a Greek and Roman goddess of the moon, wild animals, and mainly of fertility. So we have that picture, show the picture of her. Which is Get ready. Get ready. That's her. She is said to have a perpetual virginity and has several rows of what appear to be female breasts but are also believed as bull testicles. See, we had a joke. Who's going to be the one to talk about bull testicles? I forgot about that part. Well, was. It wasn't going to be me. It wasn't going to be me. <laughs> so if, if you look at it, that's, that's what they, they say, that at first glance, that's, they appear to be breasts because she's a female goddess. But then they started thinking, okay, well, you know, fertility and that kind of thing. So, When you sent that picture, the, the caption that he sent with it didn't come through at first. It was like, uh. <laughs> and this dude's all weird. Like, okay, never mind. There we go. Uh, so worshipers of hers referred to her as a savior and Lord, and they would pray prayers of protection to her, along with prayers for strength in athletic contest and could heal loved ones of diseases. Uh, they also believe that the image of her fell down from space where Dylan, the temple was. Dylan, this is for you. Some translations say child of Jupiter or of Zeus, most likely a meteorite that hit where the temple was constructed. And we can see that in verse 35. Yeah, so if, if you look at that, the, the essentially kind of the mayor. So again, we, we are in the book of Acts, and, and I encourage you to do that. But what's happening is... Paul goes into Ephesus and there's people saying, I don't like what Paul's doing. I don't like what Paul's preaching. And we're going to see that here in just a second. And, and, and here's the, go ahead, sorry. Uh, but what they're going to do is they are going to get together. A riot will erupt eventually here in Acts chapter 19. But we're going to find out why the riot erupts. It's Paul preaching the true gospel. He is preaching the truth. The truth yes. is out there. Not to sound like the X-Files, but <laughs> half you people got that. Okay. So, but he is preaching truth in the midst of this pagan world. These people worshipped her, saying that she was the savior of mankind, that she was Lord and all of this. But I want you to, to see something. So I'm going to look at Acts 19, uh, starting in verse number 23. Now, there's a guy by the name of Demetrius, and he's what we would call the agitator, the instigator, the guy who is going to get everybody else riled up because of the worship of this and the message that Paul had. So this is Acts 19, starting in verse 23. It says, about that time, some serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way, talking about Christianity. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis, that lady we just saw. He kept many craftsmen busy. He called them together along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. But as, as you have seen and heard, this man Paul has persuaded many people that handmade gods are not really gods at all. He's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the, public, the loss of public respect for our business, but I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this, this magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. I now, want, I want to add real quick for you sure. on what's leading to this too is that she was also the goddess of prosperity. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're seeing in these verses is business was being messed up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the, the points that he brings up. But I want to, when we look at something like this, Demetrius was a follower of Artemis or Diana. And he was saying, oh, Savior, Lord, but if your God could lose her prestige just like that because some guy started preaching something. What a weak God you have. Loss of public respect for business. This temple won't, won't just have the same impact because this guy's preaching another God. Your God is weak, goddess, I should say. But D Demetrius brought up three points in this passage right here. Number one, Paul's message was a threat to their business. We see that in verse 25. 
and their livelihoods. They can't feed their families because Paul's preaching the truth and then they're profiting off the lie and off the, the counterfeit. But this is not the first time that this has happened in Acts. If you guys remember back in chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they went to Philippi. Remember the, the demon-possessed slave girl? She was the, the oracle at Delphi. Remember, we talked about that. She would give people's fortunes. These two guys were profiting off of her. Paul commands that demon to come out, and they're like, well, what am I going to do? That's, that was my income. What are you doing? Yeah. So they had them arrested. So this is not the first time that, that Paul has done this, but he was threatening their business. When you want to get somebody's attention, you start talking about taking money out of their wallets or out of their pocketbook, you're going to get somebody's attention real yes. quick. Uh, and so we move forward, a riot breaks out. It's probably 25,000 people were protesting and shouting. I mean, it was a full-blown mob. And uh, one of the little side notes I read was the term ecclesia. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I'm saying that correctly, but what, that was the term for, for church, but it was an amphitheater, and it said it seated about 25,000. So yeah. we're not talking about just you know, a high school gymnasium. We're talking about a full-blown outdoor amphitheater, outdoor amphitheater yeah. coliseum of, of mad people. Yeah. I had to catch myself there. So, but of really, really upset people, the, the, the truth is being taught, and we're going to see in a minute in the next, I'm trying to skip to it, but mm -hmm. as we know, the truth is offensive. Yep. It really is. And, and you saw this, this quote. Uh, when Paul preached, two things happened. People got saved. People got mad. And that's the, the understatement of the century and, and as we, as we go quote through Acts. That was in my notes, but I think it was from Tony Evans. But I was sitting here looking at it like, isn't that kind of the goal? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't want to make people mad. But again, the truth, the gospel is, a, is offensive. Yeah. You know, and so, but I love that. People got saved and people got mad. And that's yeah. what's going to happen. We see it every day is what happens. Yeah. Yeah, and, and remember, we, we talked about this last week, that the Lord was doing unusual miracles through the hands of Paul, that these are things that we don't see anywhere else in Scripture. Amazing ministry was happening. The kingdom of God was being preached in Ephesus and all of Asia Minor, Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Everybody heard it. Now, not everybody responded to it, but we see uh, the, the spread of the, the word of God yeah. like that. But what we're about to look at is that we're making the case that Paul was up against a mountain in this, this yeah, sea of paganism. Yeah, this wasn't a place where people were on the fence. Yeah. Like, may, these were people who were firm in their beliefs. Yeah. You know, with Diane and I mean, like, they were firm in it. So this yeah. wasn't just a people kind of swayed. No, like they were dead set in their ways. Yeah. And as we saw last week, um, when people started preaching there, in, or Paul started preaching in Ephesus, people felt compelled to take their magic books, their um, you know, spell casting kits or whatever they sold at Walmart at the time, and brought it to the public square and burned it, their incantation books. They burned that as a result, a conviction of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is, these are not people who are like, well, you know, I, I like what you're saying. No, these were entrenched in their beliefs. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul references his time here in Ephesus. He says, I was, it was like fighting wild beasts. That's what he refers to in, in, in Ephesus, this mountain that he was up against. And so we're asking the question, how do I stand up for God, stand up for the truth in the midst of this kind of thing? Now, at your workplace, is it going to be the equivalent of Ephesus? No. You may have somebody who is a different religion or, you know, who is angry with Christianity or who has been hurt by Christians or the church. You may find some kind of opposition, but it's not going to be like what we see here in Ephesus. And so when we ask ourselves that question, how can I stand up for the truth of God? We need to do that. It, in every situation is going to be different. different. Yeah, uh, let's look at uh, Acts 20.19. Kind of jumping ahead a little bit in the narrative, but this is going to tell you what Paul's motivation was. So verse 19 says, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear. 
That sounds like Eric Middleton to me right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and never shrank back from telling what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike. The necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. If you don't hear anything today and all you hear is this, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. That's the gospel right there. Mm -hmm. That is the gospel. Yep. And so Paul just, I imagine we're talking about boldness here in a minute. You know, Paul's pretty bold, but you know, as we read when he talks about when he references the wild beast, what was that in, uh, in First, First Corinthians? Corinthians. Yeah. When you read that, you can kind of tell, like, he didn't really like being there. Yeah. Like, he was doing the will of God, and he was fine with that, but you can tell it was not a place that he was, he wasn't really, I won't say happy, but like. It wasn't a cakewalk. It was crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, he unintentionally starts a riot here in Ephesus by simply just teaching the truth. Yeah, and, and we see the enemy on full display yes. there in Ephesus, that they were enveloping Everyone to where Paul was trying to get in the amphitheater and be like, here, let me, I want to preach Christ to these people. That's 25,000 fish in a barrel Correct. right there. Let me in. I want to preach. Let me at them, you know, kind and of thing. The, and, the and they said, no, 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 you need to go outside for your own safety. And so we see the, the riot kind of take place, but then we see, you know, it kind of, the whole situation was diffused. But again, the question is, how can I have that type of boldness that Paul had, how can I do that? How can I leave here at church on this Sunday, walk out those doors, and have Paul's kind of boldness? It's a really good question. And not to oversimplify things, but we pray for it. But I think we get, God, help me to be bold. Okay, I, be a little more specific. Okay, and, and boldness is different for everyone. We talk about this tonight. Boldness isn't always standing on the table and pounding the table and being bold. It ain't always about that. Yeah. Being bold is simply just not accepting sin. You disagree with somebody, okay? Not getting in an argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to step back from this. I know that I'm right because I know that Jesus is right, but I'm going to step back from this because that's not the way we're going to. That's being bold. Yeah. Again, it's not always just pounding your fist. There's a time and a place for that sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, it's not accepting sin. It's being bold is praying over your children. Being bold is just standing up for the truth. And that doesn't always mean, like I said, you're just simply saying, I'm going to follow truth, not the ways of this world. Yep. And are, you want to go to the next one or you want me to? Yeah. Okay. So like, like Nate said, <clears throat> boldness is different for everyone. It's going to look different for me than it is for him. But that's why praying about boldness for me is so important. When you pray, you pray for boldness. Lord, reveal that boldness to me. How can that look in my life, in my situation, with my coworkers, with my family, with my neighbors, and, and that sort of thing? But it's also about how can we have that kind of boldness? It's about knowing who we are, but also who we belong to. That we understand that we belong to the Lord. And, and it's- I, I wanna ask yeah. this, I'm sorry, Justin. Uh, I'm sorry. We talked about this too, is, I want you to ask yourself, I mean, really ask the question, do you know who you are? I'm not saying being comfortable in our skin. Do you know who you are? I ask myself this, I'm getting there, but there's only, I can probably count in both my hands the people that I know that know who they are, that aren't searching. Now, they're still working and growing into who they are, but do we truly know not just our personality, that plays a part in it. You know, and knowing how we tick and how we think and what goes on and, but do we know who we are? I don't think a lot of us in this world do. That's why there's so many, you get some self-help books and so many, and, and, and there are some good things out there, but nobody really wants to actually peel everything back and say, mm, this is who I am. This is how he wired me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't like some of the self-help books because it's, for one, we're all wired differently. But knowing who we are, and I'm probably jumping ahead of you here, but taking an act of, a step of faith and a, a leap of faith, act of boldness, sometimes it, that's not out of like, 
all right, God, you got it. Sometimes it's like, Ugh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm just going to dive head first into this and see what happens. And mm-hmm. things may not work out like I thought they were going to. Yeah. But then you start to grow. Okay, like things didn't go well right there, but I took that leap of faith. Mm-hmm. I went in there. Now I'm going to learn from it. And you continue to do it. And as you do that, you're growing and you're learning about yourself. Then you're figuring out who you belong to. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I take the, the brand new Christian you know, they're on fire, they're saved, and they know they're Jesus, but they haven't quite, at least in my experience, it takes maturity when you know, okay, this is who I belong to. I truly am a child of God, and he's right. going to have me. But then it all works together where you're learning who you are as a person, as a man, as a woman, what your gifts are. Mm-hmm. But I think you can pray for boldness as you're learning those things, and then when you do figure out, all right, this is who I am, I'm going to continue to grow in this, all right, God, this is my personality. This is how I'm wired. How do I become the best version of that for your kingdom? Yeah. Not for myself, not for my gains, but how do I be bold and how I have faith for you and how do I trust you in you and through you, not for my gains, but for your kingdom? Yeah. And, and that boldness leads us to do certain things. And you brought this up. Like Paul, we can't wait around for someone else to share the gospel with people. Because guess what? Everybody raise your hand real quick. Everybody, everybody, everybody. It's our job. It's our job to share Christ with people. It's not Nate's. If you're waiting on Nate to share Christ with everybody, you can put him down. You may be waiting for a while and vice versa for me that, oh, Justin's got it. So no, I'm not going to go minister to that person. I'm not going to go witness to them. I'm not going to do anything. It becomes someone else's job and people start kind of doing that right there. The last point I want to make here, the message that Paul took to the people, the message that we can walk out of here today with, we are not reinventing the wheel. We just look back right there. It's on the screen. Acts 20, 21. I have had one message for the Jews and Greeks alike. Watch it. The necessity of repenting from sin, turning to God, having faith in the, our Lord Jesus. Three things. Three easy things that we can go and have boldness. That we can talk to someone about repentance. It's not a very popular message. It's not. When you ask people to stop doing their dirt, it's not popular. But it's necessity. The necessity of repenting from sin, turning to God, having faith in our Lord Jesus. I want to add... If there's anybody that's listening or anybody in here that's struggling with trust, that's struggling with trusting him because things aren't going like you wanted to, you're not sure which way is up, you feel like you're drowning. If you're having trouble trusting him, that's okay. Take it to him. He wants to hear that. He wants to know. And what you'll gain out of that is he will bring you closer if you allow yourself to be brought closer. He's sitting there waiting on you. He hasn't turned his back. But if, if that's you and you, you want prayer today, you know, you know, during this or after, like, please, you know, find an elder, find me or Justin, find Dylan, find Brent. Find, there are people who will pray with you and over you, and you're not alone. Because mm-hmm. I know the evil one tells us we're alone in that stuff, and you're not. Yeah. And, and so it may not be the same exact thing that I, you know, that I may not understand it to a T, but a lot of us in this room have been through some stuff, and we know what it's like to be wrestling with that trust and that faith. So I encourage you to seek somebody out today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that went forth here today. Lord, that message of simplicity, the necessity of repentance, turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. Lord, we just ask that those three things that Paul pointed out, that it just resonate with us. And Father, that we can truly meditate on what that means. But Lord, we also ask that you give us that boldness to go out and share that message, that message right there with others. That boldness may look different for each and every one of us. Actually, it will look different for each and every one of us. But Father, we want to trust you throughout the entire process, that we have faith in our Lord Jesus, that he will lead us where it is that he wants us. And Father, just give us the strength to act on that boldness. That we don't do things out of our own selfishness, but Father, we trust in you 
not just for the outcome, not just for the destination, but for the journey itself. Lord, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise because you are absolutely worthy of it. And Father, we love you with all of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.